Good morning. I remember a story. There was a little boy who for the first time invited his mother to their elementary school parent-teachers meeting. And so he asked his mom, Mom, will you go to our parents-teachers meeting in our school? To his dismay, his mom said yes. And so at the school, this mom was mingling with the people, but the little boy was embarrassed to show and to introduce his mom to the people. Because his mom has a big, ugly scar on the right side of her face. And so the little boy was hiding and not showing himself to his classmates, to the parents, to the teachers, because he was so embarrassed about her, his mom's ugly scar on her face. But he was able to overhear the conversation between the mom, his mom, and the teacher, his advisor. And the conversation went like this. So, how did you get that scar on your face? Teacher asked. Mom says, when my little boy was still a baby, there was a fire in the hospital room. And nobody wanted to go out and rescue him because the fire was out of control. So I went in to try to rescue my boy. And I saw this burning wood about to fall on him. I placed my entire body to cover him and protect him from the falling, burning wood. And then a wood hit my face. I was unconscious. Fortunately, there was a fireman who went to rescue both of us. You see, mother says, this scar is forever a reminder that I will give my life for my son. When the little boy heard that, overheard that story from her mom, he ran to her mom in to his mom with tears in his eyes, hugged her tight, and held her hand tightly for the rest of the day. You see, for that little boy, that scar, that ugly scar, was the symbol of his mother's love for him. They gave, willing to give her life for the sake of him. That was the most beautiful scar ever for that little boy. You see, for us Christians, we also have a symbol of the greatest love story ever told. In a sense, a scar at it, as it were. The cross for us is a symbol where Christ receives scars on our behalf. It's a beautiful scar, a symbol of Christ's great love for us. He gave His life for us. The next few days, the entire Christian world, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Protestants, and independent Christians will celebrate, pause and celebrate, and remember and reflect on this beautiful story of love. It's the story of the cross. It's a story of a scar, an ugly, ugly scar for the rest of the world, but beautiful for us. It's the love of Christ. No greater love than this. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today and we ask you to speak to us. Father, let your word be alive. Change our lives. Let it be food for our soul. Let it be a lamp, a compass, and a map to give us directions and purposes in our lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today we'll be trying to reflect on a passage that speaks of the love of God in many, 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 many ways, in various forms. And it's found in an imagery, in a metaphor of the vine and the branches. Let me show you a portion of this. But if you remain in me, Jesus says, and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love. I have told you this thing so that you will be filled with joy. 
Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You, you're my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask using my name. This is my command. Love each other. John 15 is part of a series of what they call the farewell discourse. This is a series of conversations between Jesus and his disciples the night before he was betrayed. That means everything he says should be captured because these are his dying hours, his last moments. And it is possible that the vine and the vineyard and the branches conversation happened while they were walking towards Gethsemane and they saw a vineyard, they saw a literal vine. And the spiritual conversation about it went on. The I am the vine quotation was the last of the I am series. Remember, Jesus was telling them the night he was betrayed, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. And this was the last. I am the vine. Very interesting. It's like Jesus, John, the Apostle John, was speaking of the relationship between three beings. The vineyard cares for the vine, and the vine cares for the branches. This relationship between the vineyard and the vine, and the vine to the branches, and the branches to the vine, speaks of this intimate, close love relationship between the Father and the Son, the Son and the disciples, and vice versa. It's like a conversation about love relationships using the imagery of the vine. So there are at least four things, four very, very important truths about the love of God. No greater love that we can discern from this passage. Beautiful. And this is the first. God's love involves mutual passions. In a sense, the word remain in my love has been repeated three times in this, in this paragraph. It implies that love is a two-way relationship. Alam niyo ba, wala daw relasyong tumatagal pag yung isa lang ang nagmamahal. No relationship survives if it is not a mutual passion. It's not a mutual feeling. It's not a mutual commitment. That is why our relationship with God was called a covenant. That means two parties agreeing and committing and loving each other. And so this is a mutual relationship. Since the beginning, from the Old Testament, from Revelations to Malachi, God was the initiator and He invites a response. So it's, the Bible is replete with passages that somehow speaks, we catch a glimpse, we, not totally, we catch a glimpse of the heart of God. It's a mutual love relationship. I love you, you remain in my love. So it's like God initiates, we respond. God instructs, we obey. God invites, we come. God calls, we believe. God loves, we respond, and we remain in love. So what does it mean to remain in His love? In, in the New Testament, it can be spoken of as to continue, to dwell in His love, or to abide. But in the modern language, we might say to hang out more often, or to be close to someone. That's, to remain. That's the, what, the, what it means to remain in His love. In the message version, it was paraphrased as, make yourselves at home in my love. Ah, nice. 
in the Passion Paraphrase, it says, You must continually let my love nourish your heart. It speaks of a continuous, ongoing love relationship with Jesus Christ. To remain in His love, in a sense, is to constantly respond and to constantly welcome and to constantly bask and to constantly dwell and enjoy and delight and find pleasure, our highest pleasure, in this great love of God. You see, when this happens, God's love for us and our love for God, it shapes our lives, it drives our lives, it changes our lives. And this love relationship, moreover, affects people around us as well. When we encounter the love of God, we understand how it is to love others the way God loved us. That's the way it works. It's the law of a passionate love. People who are in love, you notice, you sense something's different and fresh. Something's beautiful and changed and transformed in that person's life. When you fall in love, we begin to love others as well. You see, our society portrays love as a feeling. No? So the shows that we watch, the songs that we hear, and the books we read, talks about love as a mere feeling. And that's true, love is a feeling. But love is more than just a feeling. It's, it's a decision. Love is a commitment as well. So if you've been married for more than a week, you will now, by now know, those who have been newly married, that love is there whether you feel like it or not. You serve your spouse when he or she is sick. You drive her or drive him whether you feel like it or not. You take care of each other, you talk to each other, you care for each other, whether you feel like it or not. Why? Because love is not just feelings. It's a commitment. It's a, it's an, it's a deep, deep confidence that somebody cares for me, whether he says anything or not, whether he expresses feelings or not, whether he touches me or not. That's love. That's love. That's what the world missed. It's like we are into this roller coaster of feelings and exciting, romantic, dramatic encounters after another, and we lose the essence. Jesus says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. That's how we remain in God's love, when we obey. And then we love each other. The command is that we love each other. The second important truth about this, this beautiful passage in John 15 is this. God's love brings joyful results. One, it brings results to our requests and petitions to God. But second is, there is this joy, this sense of joy. You see, human joy in a fallen world, at best, is momentary, shallow, incomplete, until human existence is overtaken by, by the love of God. Then we understand the difference between the fullness and the pleasure and the delight we encounter when we are loved by our Maker compared to the shallow, momentary, and artificial feelings of love and feelings of joy that the world offers. You see, we were made for the love of God. There's no other way that a human being finds purpose and fulfillment unless we understand that this God wants to be a father to us and this God wants to have a love relationship covenant with us. Until we understand and encounter that, our lives we're like a ship without a sail, drifting and coasting along from one shallow joy and shallow relationship and shallow love to another. That's why we have so many addictions. You know why? Because deep in our heart of hearts is a craving for this love. It's a craving for this lover of our soul. But the problem is we're looking for this love and this ultimate joy at the wrong places. We thought sex can make us happy. We thought money can make us fulfilled. We thought applause and toys and accumulation of wealth and things and achievements and fame will make us complete. 
The truth is, until we meet God, we have nothing. We live empty lives. As the poets would say, we live in quiet desperation. Nobody knows. We flash a smile. We have nice cars and nice houses and nice family and nice selfie of our families. But deep inside, if we don't have God and we don't have the love of God, we don't have joy. That's why John 15 says, your joy will overflow if you remain in my love. It's a beautiful imagery, you know, branch and the vine. We are connected to the true source of delight, the true source of pleasure, and the true source of joy. And that's Jesus Christ. And so to find love that brings joy is through a relationship. That is why the love of God is the greatest. Our, li- our lives will never find meaning. We'll never find fulfillment unless we encounter this love. I know this for a fact. My life has been characterized by a searching, a seeking for thrill after thrill. I have so many addictions. I have so many relationships. I have so many medals and trophies. But at the end of the day, I felt so empty inside. This is the plight of humanity. That's why the good news speaks of this love. The love that never fails. The love that satisfies. Even when we, when we become born again, when we are believers, when we abandon this love, when we forsake this love, we feel miserable inside. See? It's like, it's like we're going to heaven and assured of eternal life, but we live in condemnation in hell. Deep in our hearts, we say, something's missing with my Christian life. It's because we have not abided and remained in the love of God. But the good news is, this love of God never changes. See, Romans, the book of Romans says, neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present or the future, neither anything in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God. It's amazing how powerful this love is. How faithful and consistent this love is. You can never find any kind of love in this world. Because human beings, no? we're sinners, we're failures, we hurt, and we don't follow through with our commitments and our promises. That's why when we try to find joy from people, we'll always be disappointed. But if our source of joy and source of happiness is the one who is truly, truly love. Then, no matter how people fail, we just show love in spite of their failures. Because they are not our sources of happiness. God is. Does that make sense? That made sense to me a few years ago. I realized that my wife, my child, or my friends, or anybody, nobody, anyone else could really, really make me happy. Only God can make me happy. And so, this happiness and this joy and this love overflows to whatever relationship I have. The third truth we can discover from this passage is this. That God's love increases relational closeness. I like this. This is my favorite. The change of relationship from servants, from slaves to friends. It's mind-blowing. No? It's like so radical. The difference is not in the attitude, but because both servants and friends obey. The difference is in the communication. Better yet, the difference is how they relate. Servants or slaves, they blindly obey. But friends, ah, it's an entire ballgame. They are taken into confidence. A slave does not have a close relationship with the master. But friends, ah, that's different. A slave does what he is told to do. But a friend will do things for the sake of friendship and for the sake of love. A slave lives under the emotions of fear and duty and obligation. Many Christians are like that. Very sad. But a friend, ah, is motivated by love and joy. Iba daw ho ang usapan pag barkada mo. 
Iba rin ang usapan kapag ka boss mo, kausap mo. There is a whole world of difference between relating with your boss and relating with a good friend. You know, you know this deep within your bones. When your boss is around, he is not friend. Imagine if I communicate with my boss like I talk to my friend, I'm fired the following day. But can you imagine if I talk to my friend like I talk to my boss, the friendship ends right there and then. But if your boss is actually your friend, ah, that's a different mechanics. That's a different chemistry. If your boss is your best friend, it's a different, it's like, it's not in the box. Jesus says, you're my servant, but now I call you friends. This love changes the way we see ourselves. For the first time in our lives, we understand, we value, we matter, we're acceptable, we're special because of the love of God. You see, some of you know me, I grew up feeling unaccepted, unloved. My whole life was a life of performance, trying to earn my father's love, trying to please people and earn their favor and approval and acceptance. It's a very, very exhausting life if you come to think of it. Trying to impress every people all, all the time, trying to please everyone, make sure that I get good grades, and my principals and my teachers approve of me. But when you encounter the gospel, you start to rest. It's like you enter a, 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 a season of rest. It's like, finally, I don't have to impress God. That's the gospel. So if you live your Christian life into performance mode, you know, what does God think of me? Does God hate me? Does God condemn me? I'm a failure and I made these mistakes. Maybe God does not love me anymore. If you're into that mode, you have no rest. You have no peace. You have no... You don't remain in His love. But you notice, when you understand the clarity of, hey, you're not my slave anymore. You're my friend. Something changes. First, it changes the way you see yourself. The way you approach God, and the way you approach the relationship with God. The way you see the world, it it's different. It's one of the truths that, are, that is viral and contagious. Huh? I'm a friend of God. It changes everything. You see? It's so revolutionary. That's why they call this the good news. The truth that changes how we see ourselves in the light of God's love. We're valuable, we're significant, we're precious, we're acceptable, and we are loved. That is who we really are. God's love radically changes our identities. This love changes how we view our lives and our purpose and our existence. Jesus Christ died on the cross for me, and because of that, God made me his friend. Oh, Christ made a way for me to find God's love. That's the truth of God's Word. The final truth we can f discern from this passage is this. God's love includes sacrificial actions. The greatest thing a person do, this passage says, for his friend is to die for him. See? See the sequence? You're no longer my servants, you're my friends. And the greatest thing a friend can do to a friend is to die for the one he loves. That's amazing, no? It's like, it's like Jesus is saying, the only way I die for you is I show you my highest love and that's sacrifice. That's the meaning of the atonement. Jesus dies for people he loves. Mm. This lays out the standard of love. Jesus, disciples are to show to others and to one another. This is also a repeated phrase. You love one another. This is my command. You love one another. 
And when you love one another, I'm not talking about saying nice words and giving nice things. He says, I'm talking about giving your life as I gave my life to you. That's the love he's talking about. He's talking about a love that he, that he, that he exemplified, that we, have, we ought to emulate. Parang sinasabi ni Lord, bibigay ko ang buhay ko sa inyo dahil mahal ko kayo. Kayo, magmahalan din kayo. Parang sinasabi niya, magbigayan din kayo ng buhay niyo sa bawat isa. There's something beautiful about that kind of sacrifice that inspires us. Even non-believers understand this. You, when you watch a movie of people giving their lives for their country, of people giving their lives for their children, of people giving their lives for their families, or people giving their lives for their friends. Ah, ah, when people give their lives for their enemies. It's so beautiful. Why? Because some, somewhere in our hearts we understand that's Jesus Christ. It's a type of Christ. Can you give your life for people who hate you and who spit on you and beat you or gossip on you or slander you? Can you give your life? Will you die for people who want you dead? <laughs> and Jesus says, hey, this is different. It's agape. This is love. When you give your life, the people you love. You ought to live like this. You ought to love like this. That's why he ends the paragraph. You love one another. You die for one another. Ooh, that's a different way to live, huh? When you stop thinking that you are the center of the universe and you start looking at the the needs of others, the concerns of others, the burdens of others, no longer your burdens alone. Jesus changes how we see ourselves. Jesus changes how we see others. They're worth dying for. Jesus changes how we see God. It's not a tyrannical slave master. He's a friend. He changes how we see this relationship. That is a mutual relationship he loves. We respond and remain in his love. Hmm. That's why 1 John chapter 3.16 also says this. By this we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us. So we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Hmm. John Calvin speaks eloquently on this. He says, Christ suffered for the sins of the world and in the goodness of God is offered unto all men without distinction. His blood being shed not for part of the world only, but for the whole human race. This is very consistent God sent Jesus Christ into the world that the world through him might be saved. And that is the reason why Jesus is referred to as the Savior of the world. In dying for the whole world, Christ tasted death for every individual person, which makes him truly the Savior of all men. That is why the highest expression of God's love for the whole world is Christ dying for the sins of the world. Jesus was declared by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Even the Apostle Paul asserted this. For the love of Christ controls us, he says, because we are convinced that the one has died for all and therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Hmm. First John says, Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's why Paul says, Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all. 
And God's, because of God's unlimited love and God's desire to reconcile the world to Himself, Christ died for all individual persons in the world. That means God loves all people. He desires all people to be saved. And those who believe in Christ receives this free gift of salvation. Remember the movie during my time no? in the 90s? The movie Titanic. I saw that movie five times. Maybe some of you saw it more, more than five times. And every time I see that movie, I cry. And there was this portion of the movie where, where, where Jack is holding Rose's hand and Rose was on a plank of, of door or wood floating. They're in the middle of the sea while the huge ship Titanic was about to sink. And Jack cannot stay with her on this floating plank of wood because if he does that, both of them will sink. So Jack sacrificed himself and stayed on the water. And then they were holding hands, googly eyes, staring at each other, and this romantic violin, background music going on, and everybody in the theater is crying, and they were saying goodbye to each other. Jack, don't let go. Rose, Jack, Rose, Jack. Remember? Remember that, no? But very romantic. And then Jack finally lets go. Rose lives. Jack dies. This is the picture of the love of God. Imperfect human stories will never suffice to describe what Jesus did for us. But that's the love of God. He gave His life. He gave His Son to die on our behalf. He gave every one of us, every person, a chance, an invitation to experience this love. This love changed my life. I grew up starving for love. Looking for love in the garbage places. And every time I go to the garbage, filled my stuff with false love, I felt more empty and more hungry. You keep coming back to the garbage. Until one day you found out where the true banquet is, where the true feast of love that satisfies your soul is. It's in Jesus Christ. That's the message of this week. It's the message of a God who became human and gave his life so that every person has a chance. An invitation. It's an open invitation. Come. You who are tired, come. You who are thirsty, come. You who are sick and have been laid in. I will give you, if you come, I'll give you rest. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this great love. No greater love than the love you showed through Christ, through the cross. We are grateful. As we reflect on this in the next few days, together with the whole Christian world, about the power, the beauty of the cross, help us to live like you, to love like you, to die for others, to die for you. Help us, teach us, guide us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's reflect on what we heard today as we listen to this song.